Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study, which is really being done on Thursday night. And tonight we're talking about Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, Isaiah is an am amazing book. It, tonight we're going to be talking about one of my favorite chapters of Isaiah, I'm sure yours also, The Suffering Servant. Isaiah has been giving us the songs of the servant, as you remember, four of them to be specific about the Lord's servant. Amazing prophecy, 760 years before Jesus would be born, and it's about the Messiah to come. The answer for Israel, and it's also about the desire of nations, fulfilled totally by Jesus of Nazareth. So as we look here tonight, you can see these songs. They start in chapter 42, and they end up in where we're going to go tonight in chapter 53. We are on the fourth song tonight. We finished the fourth song, and I believe the most powerful song. The Psalm 53 is about the suffering servant. But before we get there, each one of them tells us something different about Messiah's character. You see the first one, it talks about him being gentle, that Psalm. Uh, patient, quiet, and encouraging. The origin of the, uh, is a uh, second song, and it's word-led, co cooperation, submission, and God's glory. Uh, the basis of the Messiah would be song three, teach his teachableness, his trust, his commitment, and his surrender. And then, of course, the last one is the results of the servant, uh, despised, rejected, smitten, and cut off. So all of these talk about these characteristics of Christ, of the Messiah to come. Of course, Isaiah doesn't know he's doing that. He is prophesying way ahead of time. You have, you have to go back to verse 13 of, of chapter 52 uh, for the beginning of this song. And it's, it's, uh, it's no wonder Isaiah opens up with something like this. Song of the Suffering, he says, Behold my servant, he will prosper, he will be high, he will be lifted up, he will be greatly exalted, Psalm 52 says. Wow, God is declaring through Isaiah who and what Jesus would be uh, after his servanthood on planet Earth. Last week, we learned that his obedience, through his obedience, the servant would suffer until he appears to be less than human, the Bible says. But then the Lord will exalt him until he is undeniably more than human. He is uh, also talked about being sprinkling many nations, uh, eventually uh, shutting the mouths of earthly rulers. Here's the verse. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Think about the blood of Christ. The kings shall shut their mouth at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see. So again, massive prophecy about the Messiah, but obviously Jesus fits it very well. Isaiah 52, 15 tells us that. The Apostle Paul also quotes that verse. Every knee will bow. Excuse me, Apostle Paul talks about the same thing. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we understand what's going on here. We also see this in the chart of what's going to happen in our outline tonight is the first thing is the suffering servant is the suffering from rejection and then suffering of pain, suffering in silence, and suffering for redemption. So as we start off tonight, let's look at that first one. Suffering from rejection. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's talking about the report of this servant. Who's going to believe that this servant's going to come this way? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. We'll talk about that tonight. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now remember, it's talking about the Messiah. The Messiah has been prophesied way back in the Old Testament. And everyone thought about his kingship. Everybody thought about his rulership. Well, that's why it's saying, who will believe our report? He's not going to come as a king. He's going to come lowly, grow up before him as a tender plant. So the question, the question is pointed here. Who would believe the Messiah would grow up from such a lowly beginning? No one can believe the report. That's the rhetorical answer to that. His background would be one of a, of a tender plant, Isaiah says, or a young shoot that's like a weed and usually cut off before maturity. Also like a root out of dry ground, he says. His background is so blighted that no one would even believe he would be the seed of the royal blood, David, <clears throat> and in that, in, the, in that lineage. So think about it. Jesus never lost his label of the illegitimate son of Mary. Look what the Pharisees said to him in John chapter 8, verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. They sa then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Whether we like that or not, that's fulfilling what Isaiah has said. This is his lowly beginning. He would never outlive that lowly beginning, especially in the religious, the religious people. The Pharisees would never think of him being the legitimate Messiah. <clears throat> they, would, they would pass over him because he's, in their eyes, illegitimate. He would never stand a chance among the, uh, the religious for social recognition, let alone Messiahship. No form of comeliness, that's what Isaiah says. Look how the, Messiah, the, me the message translates that verse. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, 
a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. Man, that's kind of hits me pretty hard when we think about America and you think about all of the money and all of the, uh, all of the glamour that's there to make someone look better. Jesus had an, and this is a hard thing to say, but you have to really listen to it. He had a certain ugliness about him. And I know that doesn't, that goes way against all the pictures you have of him in your house. Goes way against that, that, that flowing blonde hair with blue eyes, which by the way, he did not have. But what it means is that he was very plain looking. He was so plain looking that you would pass him by. You would, you would, you would pass him by on the street. Now again, let me just continue to explain that. The, the, we know that Isaiah says no form nor comeliness. It means he has nothing that would be worthy of looking at. You wouldn't give him a second look. Physical features, even in Jesus' time, influence social esteem. We even today equate beauty with esteem. We think somebody's beautiful. They have a, a, different, a different level of our, of our esteem for them. Isaiah, Isaiah tells us we would pass by the Messiah and not be attracted to his looks at all. Our first reaction to a disfigured face is withdrawal. Our second reaction is to devalue the worth of that person on our scale of esteem. Abraham Lincoln suffered from ugliness throughout his life and even into his pres presidency. Those who knew him, however, sought past his physical limitations and noticed his eyes of compassion and the tenderness of his heart. At one point in his life, Lincoln is reputed to have responded to a question about his ugliness by saying this. Somebody actually asked him, is, is it a detriment for you to be ugly? Which is kind of insulting, but here's what Lincoln said, and I'm quoting. The face you have before you're 40, you cannot help, but the face you have after 40, you deserve. I think that's pretty good. Verse three, in context with the, with the book, in context of the, with his look, says that he would be despised and rejected by men. Now, don't take that separately. That actually is talking about his looks. He'll be despised and rejected of men. We know he will be no, normally, but initially, even for his looks. It's like the shock of a hidden face behind the ma half mask of the Phantom of the Opera. Those who see the face of the servant will hide their eyes, and without ever knowing the person behind the, ma behind the mask, they will write him off as inhuman. The sorrow and grief that the servant felt from hidden eyes and debasing glare, uh, glances meant that he entertained no pleasure in his rejection. It hurt him. It hurt, the, what Isaiah is in, intoning at is that, it, it, that Jesus' rejection just because of his looks hurt him deeply like it would hurt us. Yet it drove him to live with zeal, a des to desire friends, and to communicate past his rejection, to show his real inner beauty. Wow, I'll bet you never saw Jesus like I just described him to you. I'll bet you never saw him like Isaiah is describing it to him. I encourage you to look up translations. They're much more vivid than I've given you tonight of how Jesus physically looked. He brings us to the next thing. So he's suffering from just his very looks. The next thing we, Isaiah says is this, suffering of pain. He says, surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. You know this verse. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Notice it's present tense. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So although the suffering of social rejection deeply wounded the servant, the physical beating he would endure uh, brings greater pathos of pit or pity from the prophet. Just look at the words he was using to describe the coming Messiah's physical pain. Stricken, the adjective, stricken, smitten, afflicted, wounded, bruised, the nouns, chastisement, and stripes. But counterbalancing the expression of pain are the comforting words to us. The Bible says, Isaiah says, he suffered for us. All of that was for us, which should well up tears of, of thanksgiving in every one of our eyes. Three powerful words tell us what he has done for us tonight. He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity or the sins of us all. What this means is that Jesus not only took all the, our sins upon himself, he took all of our griefs upon himself and all of our sorrows. Just think about that for a moment. He knows what grieves us and what sorrows us. Think about someone that has lost someone and they're grieving. Think of someone has gone through some, some traumatic experience and they're grieving or they have sorrow. It doesn't stop there. Through his chastisement, we have, what the Bible says, our peace. And through his stripes, we are healed. It's excruciatingly, his excruciating pain and suffering are then not wasted. 
it wasn't in vain. He's done that for us. You and I can become frustrated when we try to show, uh, share the burden of someone's suffering. Do you ever go to a funeral and you want to you comfort the person, but you have a lack of words? And, and notice what I've noticed in funerals, it's all the same words. And I understand the heart, but we get tied up. We don't know what to say. It's, it's hard for us to do that. We're at a loss of words when someone is going through grief. We find, we find ourselves helpless to make a difference. But the servant, the Messiah, Jesus, his ministry of sorrow is different. It heals. It soothes. It brings peace. Look what Matthew says when trying to explain the healing ministry of Jesus. That it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah. He's, he's, prophes- he's actually quoting what we're talking about tonight. The prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. So Matthew's quoting Isaiah in the Greek, Isaiah. So Peter also quoted the same verse, the exact same verse, when he wrote at length to, com- to comfort Christians throughout the Roman Empire in the first century who were suffering through massive persecutions. First Peter 2.24 says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He's quoting Isaiah. Again, I told you Isaiah is the most quoted uh, prophet in the New Testament. All of this uh, despite the fact that we as sheep have gone astray. Think about yourself. Think about your own life. Do you deserve uh, do you deserve what Jesus gave you? Do I deserve it? Do I deserve Jesus being beaten beyond recognition? Do I deserve him having a lowly life and coming in low esteem? Do I deserve him going through all that pain for me? I mean, sometimes we hear the gospel and it becomes pretty uh, pretty routine for us. It should never be routine. He did that just for us. I've said this and you've probably heard it before. <clears throat> if you were the only person on the planet you would have still been a sinner because, of, because of, of Adam's sin, if you're the only person present today. Jesus would have still come and died for you and for me. But he did all of that, bearing our griefs and our sorrows. Could you imagine the sorrow and grief of the entire planet on his shoulders? I can't. No wonder why he wanted to have that cup passed from him. Not just our sins, but our grief and our sorrows. I, I used to think just about the sins. Jesus took our burden of sin on him, but he took our griefs on him. He took our sorrows, every tear we shed, every night that we can't sleep. He took all of that on himself, all of that excruciating mental and physical pain and emotional pain. All of this despite the fact that we are, as Isaiah says, as sheep gone astray. We did not deserve it. We were someone that wasn't even looking for that. We were far away from him. Wow, no other God, no other religion, no other belief system is so beautiful, is so great, so forgiving, so uh, sacrificial to those so undeserved. Even Peter reemphasizes it in 1 Peter. He says this, For you were like sheep going astray, 1 Peter 2.25, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Man, it puts it in context when you see it. All through the Bible, there's that theme that we are not deserving of anything God's given us. We're not deserving of anything. We talk about our blessings. We're not deserving of our blessings. We talk about our sins be forgiven. We're not deserving of that. How would it that God would send his only son to die for us? We may hear that over and over again, but we really need to take that inside. We need to assimilate it. We need to bring it inside of ourselves and, and, and let it become part of our mantra, part of our, part of our rhema to our bodies. I, again, I, I can say, wow, detail after detail of Messiah's plight is given to us. He tells us this about the suffering Messiah. He says he suffered in silence, our third point. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Think about that. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut, out of the, cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. You can't get more detailed about Jesus and what's going on. See, I, I, I can't help but say wow over and over again when I read Isaiah. Again, he's given us detail after detail of Messiah's plight. And Jesus, when he comes, would step foot by foot into those details. You see, the truth is, we like cash register type of justice, don't we? What do I mean by that? Well, that's, that uh, rings in a crime and then rings a penalty out. That's the kind of justice we want. We want cash register justice. You ring a crime in and you ring a penalty out. And whenever we suffer, our basic logic asks, what did I do wrong? It was, it was, um, it was righteous John's first question asked, to, excuse Job's first question asked to him by his friends. 
when he was afflicted, his friends came up and they probed him and they, and they provoked him and they prodded him for the sin of his life. They wanted him to confess the sin. Something's happening to you. What did you do wrong? I personally have experienced that. Maybe you have. I, I remember getting stage four cancer and everyone was so, so kind and praying for me. But there's one or two people that said, what did you do wrong? Uh, you know, all sin isn't because you've done something wrong. It's just because it's part of the, a part of the nature of humanity. Uh, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but our whole world is under sin. Good people get cancer. Saved people get cancer. Saved people get heart attacks. And so sometimes, sometimes it is from our sin, but not always. Jesus even corrected some of the people that were in his, in his own society when he said, who did sin, this man or his parents? He said, neither, but that the glory of God should be shown. So Job's friends would prod him, but they pro poked him and prodded him for that sin in his life without ever finding it, let me remind you, leaving him in disgust as a hopeless case. Job starts to complain at the end of his life because of all the stuff that's happened to him uh, and basically saying, you know, it was without a cause. Now think of him pleading his case. Jesus knew no sin. He became the human divine scapegoat for all of mankind. Leviticus chapter 1 is really where we get the word scapegoat from. It was a tradition and it was an ordinance that the Jews did. And he shall take, as the high priest, the two goats and, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast his lot upon two goats, and one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, let me tell you what he's doing. One of those goats is going to become a sacrifice. The other one, something else is going to happen to it. It says, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Here's the sacrifice. But the goat in which the lot fell to be a scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Actually, what would happen is they would actually tie a red ribbon around that, that scapegoat's neck and they'd send him out into the wilderness. Now get this, to take away the sin of Israel. That's why they would do it. It was, a, it was a custom that they would do, but the, a little did they know that that's exactly were foreshadowing Christ himself. Jesus was the scapegoat. He was all alone on that cross in a wilderness physically, and his blood ran red, taking away all of our sins. That's why that red ribbon was around their neck. You can see it all through scripture. That scapegoat would be, would be pushed into the wilderness to take away the sins of, take away the sins of Israel. Listen. In silence, Isaiah says, like a sheep before the shears, Jesus did that. That scapegoat couldn't say, don't do this to me. That scapegoat didn't say anything. He just went into the wilderness as it was driven off. Silent, Isaiah says, as being sheared before. And you can see that, that sheep is not saying a whole lot of things. It's just mute before it shears. That's the image that Isaiah wants us to see. This is Jesus. He's going to be stripped. He's going to be brutally beaten. And he's not going to say a single word. So we know our Savior is our Lamb. He's the one that has done that. Isaiah's prophesying of it. Jesus, silent, refuses to confess sins that he did not commit. Falsely condemned to die. Executed as a criminal. Buried with the wicked and the rich. Verse 9, after his death. Joseph of Arimathea, as you remember, would loan him his tomb. Uh, it was there for Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea was extremely rich. He had, we know that because he had a garden outside of Jerusalem and he had a tomb that was just hewn out, hewn out for him. So we know he was rich. Suffering in silence is more, more, is not gritting, is more than gritting your teeth against false accusations. That's not what he's saying. Isaiah says that the, that the servant, Christ, the Messiah, would suffer in silence. It's not, because, it's not just gritting your teeth against false accusations. It's the inner peace of innocence that only Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord, has known. No one else can, or no one else has, paid the penalty of our sins. All in silence. Now, can you imagine that? Suppose you or I were charged with a heinous, heinous crime today. We would retain the best lawyers we could to prove our innocence. We would plead our case. We would take the stand on our own behalf. We would complain. We would appeal. And we'd protest vehemently if we were accused. And we would claim innocence over and over and over. None of us would be silent. Jesus did absolutely none of that. Although no one more innocent ever walked the face of the earth, Jesus never complained. Jesus, an innocent man willing to die for the guilty. Even Pilate, uh, accused of nothing, though guilty of everything, proclaimed his own innocence. Notice how the interesting play of what Pilate does. He says, I am innocent of this man's blood. Think about that. I never, you know, I read that over and over again forever. Well, it's not about Jesus. It's about him. He's worried about his own innocence. He's saying, I am innocent. Well, actually, he was as guilty as you and I. 
because it's Pilate's sins that put Christ to the cross. Jesus never said a thing. Then Isaiah brings us to the suffering of redemption. He says, yet it pleased the Lord. That really kind of should bother you a little bit. It, would pre it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pre pleased God to bruise Jesus. I had to really dig deep for that one, and I'm going to share it with you tonight. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering of sin, for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Uh, by his knowledge shall many righteous servants justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. It's another enigma that escapes human uh, understanding. And it hits us when we read this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, and uh, made his soul an offering for sin, verse 10 says. So we wonder, how can God find pleasure in the suffering of his son, the servant? Isn't that what it says? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Well, the answer is in the word pleasure. The pleasure of the Lord here is not to the glee of, of whimsy or goosebumpy joy. The Lord's pleasure is actually translated in another way, his good purpose. Listen to verse 10 in the Living Bible. But it was the Lord's good plan. It was his purpose to bruise him and fill him with grief. However, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, then he shall have a multitude of children. You are a fulfillment of that prophecy right there. So am I. You are one of the children of God because of Christ. Many heirs. He shall live again, and Jesus did through the resurrection, and then some, and God's program shall prosper in his hands. I was thinking today about the name of Jesus and about people who deny that name, people who don't want to believe it. I can't fathom how people can understand how people can miss the uh, the ev the obvious jesus was a mere carpenter he was a common man that would had no looks and basically you would pass right by him he never wrote a book he never sang a song he never never wrote anything down that we know of these are all eyewitness accounts we but he never wrote anything down himself never traveled more than 200 miles away from his own home yet that name has total recognition throughout the entire world and there are almost two billion people that call on Jesus as their, as, their, as their Lord or say they're a Christian. The suffering of a servant was a necessary means to a purposeful end. The servant is exalted, is what Isaiah says. The Lord God is glorified and man can be redeemed. It's the good plan of God. Notice it says that the Lord will show him four things. One, the seed of his work. That's you and that's me as believers in Jesus today and hundreds of thousands of others, if not millions. Secondly, he would prolong his days throughout eternity. Jesus was 33 years old when he died. Middle age for Jesus was 17 and a half years old. But Jesus would re resurrect and he would resume his place in eternity forever and ever. Today, as well as, as his pre-existence, he is eternal, he is endless, and he is ageless. I got a question that was written to me by one of you out there and I uh, didn't answer it yet. I'll be answering it this week. And it was, what, tell me how, they said, tell me how Jesus, um, Jesus is God's son and how he, uh, you said, I said, in one of message, they told me, that he had pre-existence. Well, it's not right for you to believe that Jesus never existed before he was born of Mary. Jesus always was and he always will be. He's, tried, he's part of the Godhead, the triune Godhead. He left his throne in glory, Paul tells us. He came down, became a servant, became man, and then after he resurrected, he took up his throne again. Jesus always was. He pre-existed. He was always there from eternity past and he will always be there from eternity future. He's part of the Godhead. So he left that and he came down, but he's ageless. Yes, he was and is, and is of prolonged days. Um, third, he would satisfy him with knowledge of seeing the redemptive outcome of his suffering. Jesus is still seeing that. One of the reasons I believe the rapture hasn't happened yet is because I believe God has so much mercy. I believe he has mercy to try to get another soul in and another soul in. I remember when I left the church way back when, the church was doing great, thousands of people that were there. And I thought, there's never a good time to leave. I know that, that the week I told them that I was resigning, that week before, several people got saved. And I wondered about them. I thought, you know, they just got saved. How can I leave? Yet there was a timing of God. And so we realized that there's a, 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 Jesus uh, has not seen the fullness yet. I had to trust God that there was a fullness. To, but one day, God will shut that door. One day the doors of grace will shut. The last person to be saved will be saved on planet Earth before the tribulation. And God will take us up, his bride to heaven. So just think about it. Jesus now sees everyone who has, is, 
and we'll believe on him and his sacrifice long ago. He now sees that. And fourth, God will share with him the victories of his conquest over sin and suffering. Isaiah says it, chapter 53, verse 10 to 12, Living Bible. But it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him with grief. However, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, then he shall have a multitude of children. I'm going through the points I just said, many heirs. He shall live again, second thing. And God's program shall prosper in his hands. And when he sees that all that is accomplished by the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied, the third thing. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant shall make many to be counted righteous before God, for he shall bear all their sins. Therefore, I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was counted as a sinner and he bore the sins of many and he pled with God for sinners, makes intercession for us day and night. John the Revelator sang of his victory. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, think about it, and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Revelation 5.12. We don't think of that, do we? We don't think about God's wealth. We don't think about the wisdom and the strength. It's, it's all poured into Christ and it's all poured into that, that, the knowledge of Him. Today, Jesus stands as our advocate, our high priest, our intercessor before God at His throne, pleading our case, soaked in His blood sacrifice for mercy, forgiveness, and pardon for our sins. Many times in the world, it's who you know in order to get that good job in order to get that seat, front seats to a show or that behind the scenes look at a play or that aspiring actress working for a big, a big part in a, play, in a, in a movie. It's who you, it's sometimes it's who you know, many times it's who you know, or that certain interview for a job or a job itself. But in the spiritual realm, it's always who you know, not sometimes, not, not happenstance. It's always who you know to get you close to God the Father. Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to talk to you about that first part of it. Looking unto, it's talking about us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When you get to heaven, you will not need faith. You need faith here. So if he's the author of faith, that means when you were saved, Jesus started your book. Jesus started his plan in your life. And if he's the author, it means he's still writing it. Now, if it says he's the finisher of our faith, that happens when you die or when the rapture happens. So that means today, Jesus is still writing the plan out for me. And that plan is to give me a good end. Jer Jeremiah says it, an expected future, an expected end. So I can be encouraged today knowing that I've accepted Jesus as my author. I've told him, you write my story. And he's been writing my story. He's been writing your story. The first thing he wrote about you was when you got saved, whatever that day was, wherever it was. He wrote that. That was the first thing. And now he's continuing to write. That's why the enemy goes at us every time he possibly can. He wants to take some of those chapters and mar them. He wants to take some of those chapters and make them terrible chapters. But remember, the enemy is not writing your, your book of faith. God is. He's the, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So he is writing your faith. It should encourage you today because then you turn the page. Maybe you're having a bad day. Maybe you're having a bad week, a bad month. Maybe it's been a bad life, uh, but you've gotten saved. Now Jesus is turning that next page and what he's ready to write for you is a writing of blessing. It's a writing of strength. It's a writing of endurance. He's ready to write into this, in the script of your life something that he would be able to, to say, this is my plan for them. The second thing I want to tell you is Jesus is in the presence of God at this very moment interceding for you. I shared it this way one time. I said, you know, it's almost like the enemy wants to catch us on our sin and take a picture of us. So he takes that picture and the Bible says the enemy accuses us before God. He did Job. Uh, he has some type of access that he can accuse. I don't know if that's just uh, in the spiritual realm of words or if, I don't know if it's, it's something he could actually say. But suppose he takes that picture and shows it to God. This is Mark Carell. Look at him sinning. Well, the Bible says Jesus is our advocate and he's pleading for us. Jesus, the Bible says, he is the light of the world. If you know anything about pictures and photographs, if you put too much light on it, it overexposes it. And I really believe if the enemy tries to show a sin of ours, and we've confessed that sin, that the light of Christ blots it out and overexposes that, and God only sees the purity of Christ. Jesus' intercession for us is stronger than Satan's accusation against us. And that's powerful when you think about that. You know, I have people come to me all the time and say, oh, Pastor, I've done this and I've done that. And, and I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying light of it, but they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, I've sinned here and I've sinned there. I keep sinning this way or that way. Well, that, sometimes they take accusations against themselves and they take Satan's suggestion that they're so evil. Uh, but Jesus 
intercession for us is much stronger than Satan's accusation against us. It's powerful and we need to know that. Jesus did not die in vain. He did not die so that there's a, a, a weak, uh, mealy mouth type of salvation where it's there one day and it's not there another day. As long as you're loving God and you're trusting God, He's going to overexpose any type of sin that you have. Jesus to the Father so that the Father can look at you as pure through the, through the eyes of Christ. He's going to bring you to that next spot. So I want you to understand He's always there for us every single time. You know the suffering servant? He was pierced for our transgressions when translations. He was crushed for iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. I don't know about you, but that's a verse that I apply to my life every day. It's because of the wounds of Jesus Christ that I've been healed of cancer, not because of anything else. I remember I came home when, after, uh, after being healed, actually, of, uh, of cancer, and totally remission years ago, 12 years ago, and somebody said to me, well, you were healed because of chemotherapy. I said, no more than Goliath died because of that stone. <laughs> God may have used it, but it's God that heals. A doctor can't heal you. Only God can. Any, any doctor in his right mind will tell you that. They can't heal. They can administer, but they can't heal. Only God can heal. So we, he, was, he was pierced for our transgressions. Think about that. Think about the piercing of Jesus' side. Think about the pain that's there. Think about the physical abuse. Think about, the, think about the ostr uh, being ostracized from society, even because of his looks. It says, he was crushed for our iniquities. Crushed. Can you imagine? I know somebody who had their finger crushed once. They told me how, how much extreme pain it was. That word crushed there means that his entire body was under some type of pressure. His entire mental facility was un under pressure. His entire emotions were under pressure. And even his spirit was under a crushing pressure. If you can possibly imagine that. Did he want to give up? He's asked, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it says, upon him was the chastisement. That's, chastisement means the whipping. I don't know if you grew up the way I did, but if I, would got, if I got out of hand, I would, get, I would get whipped. I know that's not something easy to say today. I'm, I'm not so sure why, why people uh, steer away from it, but I would be hit, with physically hit. Jesus was physically whipped for us. So, remember in these difficult times, you know Jesus, the suffering servant, the author and the finisher of your faith, the closest to the Father who pleads your case. He'll get you in, he'll plead for you, and he'll cover you in your sins. It's always who you know spiritually. Maybe you can get ahead every now and then because you know somebody in the world, but it's always who you know spiritually. Tonight, can I pray for you? Father, I just thank you tonight. I thank you for the sacrifice of your son because it was a sacrifice for you, but it was your good plan. It was your good purpose so that you could redeem many and elevate him back to that spot that he had before. Lord, what a, what a vulnerable time it was for the Godhead. When Jesus came, Lord, the whole Godhead was, was, was exposed. The Godhead could have failed through Jesus if he had taken one sin, if he took one suggestion from the enemy, Lord God. The Godhead was vulnerable, but love is vulnerable. The Bible says that God is love. Love puts itself out there and it can be hurt so much. But Jesus was that faithful servant. The song of the servant rings true in the, in the name of Jesus. The Messiah who took away our sins, who bore our griefs, Lord God. And Lord, whose very chastisement brought our peace. I pray, Lord God, that we understand that this is not just some old story, but this is a relevant, uh, everyday, real-time experience with Christ. Bless everyone that's listened tonight, Lord God. Keep them faithful. Let them know that their book is still being written and God's the author. Bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us tonight.